Part 1, Chapter 1, A Devil in the Hills, West Cork, Paris, December 1996. The bright moon had faded and the grey dawn was breaking in the valley. Nobody in West Cork could have predicted that it would be replaced by the morning star of evil. Lights were being switched on in the silhouetted houses in the area and in the nearby villages and small towns from Goline and Skull to Ballydehab and beyond. Most householders would soon be in the feverish grip of the final preparations for Christmas Day. Some would be more advanced in their plans than others, but last-minute yuletide tasks were on the lists of even the most punctilious and organised of shoppers. It was a crisp, dry and cold day, and soon the sun would shine in a bright clear sky, unusual but welcome at this time of the year. In Tourmoor, the normal rhythm of nature, the sheep and cows that dotted the landscape, the twittering birds in the trees and bushes, created a peaceful atmosphere. That aura of solitude would soon be shattered, even if nature would remain indifferent to human tragedy. Just before 10am, Sophie's next-door neighbour, Shirley Foster, left the house, got into a white Peugeot car and eased towards the S-bend in the laneway, intending to drive to Skull. As she rounded the bend, something struck her as unusual. The gate at the laneway was open. As she slowed the car, she saw a piece of white clothing flapping from a barbed wire to the left of the concrete gatepost. She stopped the car, got out and was overcome with a sickening feeling. A crumpled shape that she first thought was a mannequin she soon recognised as a human laid on the grass margin near the gate. She fled back up the laneway to her house and alerted her partner, Alfie Lyons. He rushed down the lane to confirm her suspicion that there was a corpse near the gate which led to the valley and saw the body. He went to Sophie's house to warn her not to go out but not getting any reply, thought the body might be hers and immediately rang the emergency line for help. Alfie's call was put through to Bandon Garda Station, which is the divisional headquarters of the area and was handled by Garda Eugene McCarthy, who made notes of the conversation and then rang the nearest station in Skull, where the call was answered by Garda Martin Malone. Two colleagues on patrol, Sergeant Gerard Prendeville and Garda Billy Byrne, were told at 10.15am to go straight to the location in Tourmore. They arrived at the scene 20 minutes later and quickly established that the body was that of a woman with extensive head injuries. Garda Byrne was tasked to cordon off the area where the body lay, while Sergeant Prendeville went to Alfie and Shirley's house to make initial inquiries. The shocked and shaken couple informed him that the house next to theirs was owned by Sophie Bunyol, who had arrived some days before. The silver Ford Fiesta parked in front of the house was a car she had hired at Cork Airport, confirming the fact that she had not returned to Paris. Sergeant Prendeville rang Bantry Garda Station, spoke to Superintendent Toomey and requested help to secure the crime scene and make preliminary inquiries. As well as guarding the body of a small woman, her long blonde hair tied back, Officer Byrne also took notes of details he witnessed at the scene, including multiple injuries, particularly to the head and neck. There was a blood-stained slate rock near the body and a bloodied concrete block lying on the blue dressing gown which the victim wore over torn white leggings and brown walking shoes. A portion of the leggings were caught on a barbed wire fence. There were large amounts of blood on her hair, face and neck. The white shirt she wore was pulled above the stomach. Skull-based Dr Larry O'Connor was summoned to the scene, arriving at 11am and taking notes of injuries before pronouncing the victim as deceased and noting that rigor mortis had set in, while Catholic priest Father Dennis Cashman arrived to administer the last rites to the then formerly unidentified victim. At around 12.35pm and in the presence of the officers, and Superintendent Toomey, Josephine Helen and her husband Finbar, he identified the body as being that of Sophie Toscan du Plantier. While officers talked to Alfie Lyons and Shirley Foster for background on the victim, back in Paris, 
the Bunyol family were unaware of the unfolding investigation, not to mind the terrible death of their beloved Sophie. As the local person closest to the victim, officers took a statement from Josephine Helen. She recounted her communications with Sophie before and subsequent to her arrival. She revealed that relations between Sophie and her neighbour Alfie Lyons had been fractious in the past. There had been a quarrel two years previously over water seeping from Alfie's garden onto Sophie's property, an issue concerning an adjoining structure, and another time she had accused Alfie of using her bath and leaving it dirty. To the best of the caretaker's knowledge, those disputes had been settled. She said that Sophie most often used the front door and always left the rear door open, only locking it when she went to bed. There was a small axe for chopping wood, usually kept in a pouch under the porch. That was missing. Nothing in the local officer's experience of crime matched what they were now attempting to deal with through no fault of their own, given the absence of a forensic pathologist. There is little doubt that the traffic of people in and around the crime scene under normal circumstances provided the distinct possibility of contaminating evidence there. But that evidence had already been compromised and contaminated in advance of any single person's presence. The late arrival of a forensic pathologist did not help matters. There was a ludicrous situation where there was, apart from a locum, one chief state pathologist in a year in which there was not just a huge spike in violence and murder of women, but also a huge surge in gangland killings, a victim of which in June of that year was my colleague, investigative crime journalist Veronica Guerin, with whom I had been working on a screenplay about her work, which became the movie When the Sky Falls. The consequence was that Dr John Harbison, the chief state pathologist, was run ragged with a huge number of cases, and having been socialising the night before the murder, could not travel to West Cork until the following day, as the usual practice of Gardaí driving to the scene of a crime was not in operation. In crime scene investigation, the speed of the examination is invaluable for gathering evidence as quickly as possible to establish the cause and time of death of the victim. The latter is often linked to two factors, the state of rigor mortis and the ambient temperature. Tissues in the human body begin to break down almost immediately after death, and delay in getting the body to a morgue can make it harder to determine the time of death, a process that at the best of times is not an exact science. Postmortem rigidity, which usually sets in between two and four hours after death, is caused by chemical changes in the muscles. Under normal conditions, it lasts from eight to twelve hours, but could be present for another eighteen. It can be helpful in establishing an approximate time of death. The ambient temperature has an influence on the post-mortem process. In extreme heat, body changes are more rapid, while the opposite is true in extremely cold conditions. In freezing conditions, which was the case in two or more, the progress of rigor mortis is considerably slowed and therefore could not provide a reliable guide to the time of death. That in no way excuses the delay. It is a scientific fact. Forensic aid was provided to the investigation from the National Forensic Laboratory in Dublin for the normal but expert crime scene investigation, including photography, gathering of trace evidence and samples of blood at the scene and around the body, but not on it. This was the pathologist's area. But the only problem that might occur, as it would transpire, was the inability to preserve small blood samples in an open environment as opposed to a closed one, for example, within the house. Not in relation to the victim, but rather the perpetrator. The body had been lying near the gate and exposed to the elements for approximately eight hours before the arrival of investigators, and a further 28 hours passed before the arrival of the pathologist. The weather factors included wind, an extremely cold temperature and sun, during this vital period at a crime scene in the open, and one which stretched back from where the body lay to the rear door of the house, vital trace evidence, such as fibres and hair, could be dispersed by the wind and blood evidence contaminated. Any blood left by the killer, especially in contact with the briars and barbed wire near the body, 
could have been compromised by the temperature, literally frozen and further diminished by the wind and the sun, all of which play key roles in the destruction of such evidence on a crime scene, exposed as in this case to the elements for so long before the discovery of the body. In such a situation, accurate laboratory testing of small quantities of such blood samples is rendered virtually impossible. Therefore, the investigation of this horrendous murder began at a distinct disadvantage, most pertinently in the matter of gathering vital forensic evidence at the crime scene. This, among the many myths that would emerge about the case, had nothing to do with the lack of expertise on behalf of the forensic team who gathered evidence at the crime scene. The basic pattern of what had happened at the scene was quickly established by the crime scene investigators. There were bloodstains on the jam and the knob of the rear door, indicating this was the location for the first stage of the assault. There was further blood staining on a flat rock halfway down the incline of the garden. This indicated that the victim had fled the first site and was hit by a projectile thrown from behind, most likely a flat rock, which was then picked up by the attacker with the intention of using it again. Sophie had then fled to the gate on which blood spattering indicated a prelude to the third and the most violent attack in which the perpetrator was intent in finishing the kill in an orgy of violence. She was pulled back from the gate, fell to the ground and attempted to crawl through the briar bush like a desperate animal fleeing from the hunter. There was a distinct possibility that the killer sustained scratches and wounds while pulling the victim away from the briars and barbed wire. It would be posited that the first weapon employed was a missing Kindle hatchet, which had been in a pouch inside the rear door. Its position indicated that Sophie may have taken it to protect herself. A slate rock was also used. Her body had been pulled back from the bushes, where part of her leggings were caught in the barbed wire. It had appeared, but to be confirmed, that a concrete block was dropped on her face and head. There was no sign of the Kindle hatchet. This weapon had the most potential evidence linking the killer to the crime scene, including latent prints, biological and trace material and transfer evidence from the victim. The fact that it was missing, obviously disposed of somewhere else, provided proof that the attacker had some forensic knowledge. The general pattern also established that there were multiple crime scenes stretching from the side door of the house into the sloping field below and leading to the final location in front of the gates and beside the bushes and briars and barbed wire of the border fence. A blue plastic covering had been placed over the body to preserve it from the elements and contain any trace evidence of foreign blood, DNA or fibres deposited on the corpse or the clothes worn at the time of death. There is a common and repeated misconception that there was no forensic evidence at the scene to provide a link to or match with the perpetrator. According to the famous French criminalist Dr Edmund Locard's exchange principle, the perpetrator of a crime will bring something to the scene and leave with something from it, and every contact leaves a trace. In this instance, there had been a frenzied contact between the killer and the victim who had fought with every ounce of her small frame for her life. While the killer, in this case say of a tall man or even one of average height with a long reach, may have had less direct contact with the tiny victim than a smaller man. He had moved the body when pulling it out of the briery bushes close to the barbed wire. It would be impossible to complete this action without leaving trace evidence on the body, and particularly the clothes, if only fibres from his own clothes. The American forensic scientist and criminalist Paul Kirk translated Locard thus, Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as a silent witness against him. This is evidence that does not forget. It cannot perjure itself. It cannot be totally absent. Only human failure to find it, study and understand it, can diminish its value. So, it is utterly clear that the killer must have left trace evidence both at the scene and on the body and clothes of the victim, and blood evidence which had most probably been dispersed and contaminated by the elements. But its value in more ideal circumstances 
is only realised by matches with the killer, particularly blood evidence from the victim, on his boots and his clothes. If he washed himself thoroughly over time and destroyed everything he wore on the night, the duvet, sheets and mattress of the bed he slept in, there would be nothing left to provide a vital link. Therefore, it would be incumbent on the investigation team to move as quickly as possible in the circumstances. An initial examination of the interior of the house revealed nothing out of the ordinary. There was no sign of a break-in or any struggle. The keys of the house were found in the locked main front door. The rear door was unlocked. Inside, all appeared normal. The lights were off. There were two washed wine glasses beside the kitchen sink and an unfinished glass of wine in the living room. The book with the honey pot as a bookmark lay on a table with a bowl containing olives. Now the lights were off. This might be explained in the context of loud and rapid knocking of the door, which caused Sophie to rush to open it to a daylight effect from the rays of the full moon. Upstairs in the room which the victim had occupied, the sheets were pulled back from the mattress on the floor with a cordless telephone next to it. Sophie's passport, a wallet with ten bills of twenty Irish pounds, several bank cards in her name and the keys of the hired Ford Fiesta car were also found in the room. The scene indicated clearly that Sophie had been in bed when the killer had called to the door. She had descended the stairs, put on her walking boots, went to the door, unlocked and opened it. There is little doubt that she recognised the midnight rambler and wondered what had brought him to the house at such an unearthly hour of the night. Some introductory conversation must have ensued, during which he had revealed the purpose of the visit and was rejected out of hand. This rejection alone does not explain the explosion of rage and violence that followed. He may have laid hands on her in the act of making a pass and forcing his lascivious intentions on her. The kindle hatchet in the pouch was close and possibly Sophie grabbed it and in an act of self-defence hit the attacker, who possibly pulled the weapon from her and struck the struggling woman who then escaped through the door and ran into the garden in a vain attempt to save her life. In the grip of explosive anger, he determined, as he had done before to another, to beat the living daylights out of the French woman, who not only had the gall to reject him, but had also hit him. The Bunyol family in Paris were totally unaware of what a terrible event had occurred, while by mid-afternoon in Tour Moor there had been a large media presence gathered outside the gate at a distance from the crime scene. The first journalist to receive information about an incident in the area was West Cork correspondent for the Cork-based examiner newspaper, Eddie Cassidy. The tip-off gave him little detail, other than that there had been a fatality in Tour Moor the nature of which was not communicated other than the victim was a foreign national. That gave him no clue, as West Cork had become a haven for foreign nationals of both means and none at all, such as a contingent of New Age travellers, a member of which Cassidy assumed could have figured. He had no idea of the import of the story and contacted several colleagues who worked for other media outlets, rightly assuming that there was safety in numbers in the matter of eliciting more information. Among them was an out-of-work journalist, Ian Bailey, who had been contacted at 1.40pm by Cassidy to check out a death in the area and who with this minimal information had driven straight to the crime scene. While he was on that short journey, journalist Cathy Farrell revealed in a 2pm news bulletin on local radio station 98FM that the victim was a French national. Shirley Foster told investigators later that on that day between 2.15pm and 2.30pm, while outside the guard of protective cordon at the crime scene, she had come across Ian Bailey and Jewel Thomas in a car, and when she told them that police had installed a barrier in the area, Bailey had replied that he was there on official business for the newspaper, The Examiner. As the day wore on and darkness fell, teams of officers took turns to protect the crime scene, while other members of the investigation team were putting together the details of Sophie's movements and people she had met in the days since she had arrived. By now, the limited details of the murder had spread through the rural community like a wildfire, causing shock, disbelief and fear, 
and reporters attempted to add some flesh to the bare bones of the story. By mid-afternoon, a larger gathering of local and national media had assembled near the crime scene, but were kept at a distance by the Gardaí assigned to protect it. All had by now realised that this was in fact a huge story with international dimensions, as the victim was the wife of a famous French film producer and a familiar figure in West Cork and frequent visitor to her holiday home, which was now part of the crime scene. Soon it would become an international story with the arrival of reporters from France and England. Still, neither the Irish police nor their French counterparts, for some reason, had managed to reach the family, a dreadful state of affairs which would magnify the grief both in the present and the future. Marguerite, Sophie's mother, was watching the 8pm news bulletin which carried a small report about the murder of a French woman in West Cork. She was overwhelmed by the feeling that the then unnamed victim was her daughter. When Skull was mentioned, she knew for certain that it was Sophie. Daniel was an Ambex, in the company of his good friend Gilles Jacob, distinguished chairman of the Cannes Film Festival, when he saw the same bulletin and said to him that it could not have been Sophie, and then in fright began to try to work out what had happened. About 10pm his son rang the house. Josephine Helen answered, but said as instructed by the police that she could not talk. Sophie's cousin Alexandra took on the task of trying to confirm her aunt's worst fear. She managed to get hold of a member of the investigation team, but was told that he had no authority to name the deceased. She eventually spoke to Josephine Helen and asked her if Sophie was alive. The devastating answer which Josephine could not have avoided was no. Her sister Patricia passed on the news to their mother, Marie Madeleine, who in turn informed Georges and Marguerite, Sophie's parents. Daniel had received independent confirmation from the French Minister for Foreign Affairs. The immediate family began making plans to travel to Cork. It was approaching midnight. Daniel decided not to travel, as he had been given some details of the attack on his wife and could not bear to witness the horrible injuries on a woman he wanted to remember as he last saw her. This would later draw negative media comment, but suffice it to say that people's reaction to bereavement differ. Some confront and take charge, whilst others withdraw. The following day, December 24th, after disembarking in Cork after a flight from Dublin, the state pathologist, Dr John Harbison, was driven to the crime scene, where he performed a preliminary examination of the corpse in situ, starting at 3.57pm, just 30 hours after the discovery of the body. He noted that the victim was a small woman, measuring 1.66 metres in height, whose body was covered by a canvas sheet. She was lying on her back along the sidewalk near the entrance gate, the head slightly tilted towards the wall, left arm stretched over the body and the right elbow bent at a right angle at 45 degrees from the body. The right hand was under the corpse and the head, shoulders and the right arm were covered with blood. Blood also stained the left arm, the abdomen and the region of the right hip. The victim wore a cotton t-shirt, long johns, socks and shoes with thick soles. Her long johns were attached to an iron wire that marked the boundary of the lot and were partially torn at hip level. The tear exposed the lower part of the abdomen, the pubis and the part of the right hip and thigh. The blood stains on her clothes were mostly circular in form, which suggested that they had fallen vertically over the long johns instead of dripping from the head to the legs. Gaping wounds were visible on the right side of the forehead, showing a depression on the skull from the eyebrow to the temporal bone. The lower part of the right ear was seriously cut and the right cheek had several abrasions. Beside the left shoulder and head was a stone that looked like a slate and was stained with blood. Between the body and the barbed wire was a prefabricated hollow building block with two cavities through its length, measuring 18 inches long and 9 square inches. Moreover, Similar blocks constituted the top part of a structure built around an electric pump 
twenty to thirty feet from where the body lay on a hill. They were not cemented together. One full block and a half were missing, and two others were displaced. The block that was beside the body seemed to come from this structure. After assisting the investigator, who was on site in covering the head with a plastic bag, a process that was revealed to be difficult because of the many tangles on the victim's hair, the pathologist noticed that rigor mortis had particularly set on the neck and right elbow. This indicated the slow progress of rigor mortis caused by the weather conditions. It usually starts in the smaller muscles of the face and neck and makes its way down and could only be used as a guesstimate of the time of death. Once the body was carefully removed, a blood-filled depression under the head was noted and the pathologist deduced that the body had already been in that position when the final blows were administered, as the spot contained the largest amount of blood pooling. Samples were taken from under the nails of both hands. Around a dozen hairs were attached and coiled around the right-hand fingers, and two were attached to the back of the left hand. Similar samples were taken from the buccal, vulval, vaginal and thigh areas. Afterwards, Dr Harbison and members of the investigation team follow the hearse containing the body to Cork University Hospital, where the pathologist performed a detailed post-mortem. This examination revealed further evidence of the brutal and horrific attack on Sophie Toscan du Plantier. There was a tear on the upper lip, abrasions and a long laceration on the lower lip, a bone fracture on the face, and there were multiple lacerations on the right temple and cheek. On the neck, there was a grey zone showing nine parallel scratches that suggested traces made by Dr. Martin's type boots or a jagged object that could have been used to slice the neck. There was a linear abrasion under the stomach and multiple scratches on the back, two clusters of which could correspond to blows from the concrete block, scratches on the buttocks and left arm and two incisions on the base of the index finger, the former of which could have come from thorns and brambles and the latter from a sharp weapon. On the right arm, there were two series of scratches which could have come from the Dr. Martin's type boots, an incision of the skin at the base of the right thumb and contusions at the back of the hand. On the legs, there were isolated clusters of scratches at the back of the right thigh, the back part of the knee and behind the calf. Dr. Harbison concluded that death had been caused by multiple lesions on the head with fractures to the skull and injury to the brain. The wounds to the hands were considered to be signs of defence, which demonstrated the fact that the victim had fought desperately hard for her life, prompting the attacker to inflict even greater injuries. Most of the wounds were caused by blunt objects, one of which was light and the origin of minor wounds, and at least one other heavy and the origin of fractures on the skull and its base. The hollow block and large slate-like stone discovered near the body could have been used to inflict further wounds on the head. There was the use of a Dr. Martin's type boot to inflict additional injuries to the neck area and the pathologist determined the time of death to be the night of December 22nd or at the first hours of December 23rd. The extent of cuts, lacerations, bruises and deeper wounds spoke of a frenzied and brutal attack and included broken fingers sustained in a protective reaction as well as hair from her head in a hand that had been caused also by an effort to protect injury from blows to the head. When a person is facing a strike in the face, he or she will automatically lower and turn their head away from the blow to protect their face and eyes. They will automatically place their hands in a protective gesture to shield the face and thus will sustain severe injuries to the hands. Some lighter wounds were caused by a missing weapon the Kindle hatchet, which the perpetrator had taken away and disposed of, while the extensive trauma to the face, head and shoulder areas were caused by the rock slate and the concrete block. Information on all of which was not released and was only known to the top tier of the investigation team. All of the weapons had already been on the scene outside the house, therefore they were defined as weapons of opportunity utilised by an attacker in the grip of a deadly rage probably sparked by rejection when he had been looking for sex and fuelled by alcohol and drugs. 
It would not be necessary to be a graduate of the FBI Quantico unit for an investigator of this crime to arrive at the conclusion that it was the work of a psychopath. But even in the absence of a profiler who would provide a psychological portrait of the killer, the apparent random nature of the crime, the use of weapons of opportunity and the use of the rear door indicated a person with local knowledge and who had some knowledge, however slight, of the victim, her movements over the previous days and information that she would be alone for the first time at the location. It was not and could not have been the work of a stranger to the area or the location. The killer was also familiar with the layout of the house and surrounding grounds and countryside. Since there had been apparently no sight or sound of a car in the area in the early hours of the morning, the killer would have faced making his way home by foot. But one woman in the area had heard a car driving by in the late hours of the morning. But one way or another, there would have been no portion of his clothes, shoes, hands and hair that would not have been exempt from the blood of the victim. Blood velocity from the impact of such an attack could travel up to 10 feet. Blood spatter on clothing does not drop away unless it is water repellent and it was unlikely on a cold, dry day and night that the killer would have been wearing waterproof clothes. There is no doubt that the attacker would have sustained cuts and grazes when pulling the victim away from the briar bushes and barbed wire, possibly on the face, but certainly on the hands and forearms, which would have been difficult to conceal. The backward arc of the sharp-edged hatchet used during the striking would have deposited blood drops in the hair on both shoulders and on the back of the attacker's coat. It would have been considerably less than the front and sleeves, which would have absorbed more because of the position of the killer while attacking the victim. Blood travels in a trajectory which is essentially parabolic or curved as a result of gravity, so there would be a large concentration of the victim's blood on the perpetrator's mid to lower coat, the exposed portion of the trousers and on the boots, which had to be close to where the greatest intensity of blood pooling was found, next to the victim's head, and one of which would have been used in a kicking action to the arm and neck. When a significant amount of blood is transferred to boots, even if the killer immerses them in water, evidence of the original blood will remain, especially on boots with ridged soles. Blood is so viscous and sticky that even a high concentration on the soles would provide, depending on the terrain, a trail of no greater than 50 feet. The ground on and around the crime scene given the temperature and weather conditions, was rock hard, so it was highly unlikely that sole impressions would have been left, as might be the case in soft and wet conditions. The most direct concentration of blood, tissue and fingerprint evidence would have been on the hatchet, so it would be a simple matter of ensuring that this was disposed of in conditions where it would be impossible to find until that evidence dissipated for the killer not to be connected with the scene. Or the crime. There were a lot of factors in favour of the killer that night, including the location, the light of the full moon, the temperature, the underfoot conditions on rock hard ground, and the unlikely chance of being witnessed before, during, or after the crime, and most importantly, the lapse of time in weather conditions, which resulted in dissipation and contamination of forensic evidence. This was also true of the nature of the two other weapons employed, the slate rock and the concrete block. Unless the user was losing blood from a deep wound sustained in the struggle, there would be little to connect or match him to the weapons. Fingerprints would not easily adhere to the slate surface, which could in any event be easily wiped, while this would be virtually impossible on the surface of a concrete block. Had he sustained less severe wounds, for example, a semi-deep head wound or surface lacerations to his hands or arms, it would be easy to stem any light seepage with a coat sleeve or handkerchief, as there would be no gushing or spattering without the velocity of blood incurred by more serious trauma. Even blood on a weapon like the hatchet is not easily displaced, and even vigorous shaking and swinging will displace only small drops. Blood drips from the face and hands act in the same way as from the weapon but the fact remained 
that the killer would never have been able to immediately get rid of the extensive blood evidence when he eventually arrived home. And he would have been well aware that he had left at least fibre evidence on the scene and the body. Blood-stained clothes can be compromised as evidence in a limited manner by the application of a detergent such as bleach. The only completely effective way to dispose of them would be to burn them to ashes. Members of the Bunyol family, including Sophie's parents, George and Marguerite, Aunt Marie Madeleine and Brother Bertrand, arrived in Cork on December 24th. They were interviewed separately by police officers without an interpreter, which must have been trying, the difficulty emphasised by the fact that the parents didn't have anything like a comprehensive grasp of the English language. Daniel Toscan du Plantier did not travel, because he said that after conversations with the police, he knew the disfiguring extent of the injuries and wanted to preserve his memory of her beauty. Gilles Jacob would confirm that he had never seen someone so upset and Daniel had not got the courage to go to Ireland. Still, the stance is hard to understand or accept, particularly from a man of such status and power. It was not a privilege her family could or would have chosen. They had to face the awful physical evidence of the nature of the killing. It was not until St. Stephen's Day, December 26, that they were given permission to visit the funeral home in Cork, where Sophie's body had been laid out. The prospect would have been emotionally difficult enough had they been viewing their beloved in her coffin with her beauty intact, even with the assistance of the mortician's art. That was not possible. Such was the impact of the crushing injuries to the face and to her beautiful hands, with her shattered fingers encased in bandages. Devastated by the loss, the savagery of her death, and the contemplation of the terror of her last moments on earth, the family's suffering was magnified by the fact that they could hardly recognise Sophie, and they had all been plunged into a waking nightmare. Inevitably, the grief of family and friends was accompanied by a sense of guilt that they had not been there to protect their beloved Sophie, and that had even one of them travelled with her to West Cork, then this tragedy would never have happened. Daniel later said in an interview that there was a devil somewhere in the hills of Southern Ireland, and in his interaction with the press and family displayed more than adequate evidence of his grief. He said that the tragedy was too much for many of his colleagues, and that the filmmaker, with whom Sophie had such an intense debate in the Paris club the night before her departure, had never spoken to him since. I think he just cannot bear to experience the emotion and grasp the reality of what happened. Nobody imagines that it happens to their friend or relative, but to Sophie? It was inconceivable that such a bright, talented, ambitious woman could suffer this fate. Nobody could speak of it without emotion. The famous French film director Maurice Pilat lived next door to their country home in Ambex. Daniel had produced his Cannes award-winning film Under the Sun of Satan, and the director had become friendly with Sophie and was naturally devastated by her death. As a measure of his affection for her, he told Daniel that he may have lived with great French actresses, but that Sophie was the star. For the Bunyol family, that experience would not be limited to one jurisdiction, and the sense of alienation that it produced had already begun during their first contact with the Irish authorities, where they were greeted with scepticism and officious coldness that characterises the establishment and progress of a criminal investigation. <laughs> 